So Freud starts listening to these stories of thwarted or twisted, uh, frustrated desire, and he starts to theorize that what his patients are suffering from is um, uh, the past. They're suffering from history, uh, we might say. Freud says in studies on hysteria that hysterical, hysterical patients, the hysterics he's treating, suffer mainly from reminiscences. Hysterics suffer mainly from reminiscences. It's the past that makes us ill. That's Freud's fundamental claim. It's history that creates pathology. And what, by understanding history, even if it means stirring up the depths, by understanding history, we have a better chance to live a life that has less suffering and more possibilities uh, for happiness and love and work, as Freud sometimes said. Now, Freud was a pretty pessimistic guy. He wasn't looking for um, uh, a, a, a mode of therapy or understanding that was going to make everybody happy and everybody's going to be, you know, uh, running through the fields of flowers and singing Kumbaya or something. Nah. Freud says, what my goal is to reduce hysterical misery to common unhappiness. That's, that's, he said, no, he's a, he's a, a, a pessimistic um, uh, um, thinker and a sober physician most of the time, most of the time. Um, and uh, in uh, his great work, I mean, it's a big book of, of, uh, that really sets uh, psychoanalysis going in, in a dramatic way. His big book is called The Interpretation of Dreams, as I said before, published in 1900. Uh, and dream interpretation is important for Freud uh, because it's dream interpretation uh, that, uh, he says, is the royal road to the unconscious. Dreams are the royal road to the unconscious. And that's because in dreams, uh, Freud thinks, we actually are expressing parts of ourselves, parts of our sexuality or desire, if you will, um, that during our waking era we censor. And so dreams... They get by the censorship of our waking life, uh, and they get by our, that censorship through disguise. Our wishes are disguised in dreams. And so in the interpretation of dreams, Freud says every dream um, is a, a disguise, has a disguised wish at its core. Every dream has a disguised wish at its core. And the job of interpretation is to show what you really desire. And in a way, that's really what Freud is about. Uh, Freud is, all the, the Freudian question is always, what do you really want? What do you really hope to get out of this? Now that can be an offensive question if you're sitting there and you're struggling, like you can hear today, I have a cold, right? You, have a, you can hear perhaps in my voice, I have a little congestion. The psychoanalytic question is, mm, yes, you have, a, you, have a, you have a cold. What are you getting out of this cold? And my, why would I, I don't know, it's not, it's not my fault I have a cold, it's not my fault I'm sick. But the psychoanalyst question is, yes, but what are you getting out of the cold? What do you, you know, how does the cold, how does the, your, your symptom, how does your symptom give you satisfaction? That's the, that's the Freudian question. And it's, it's sometimes very offensive because you go to the doctor and you say, I'm suffering, I have this, you know, I have this neurotic tick, I keep hitting myself in the head. And the psychoanalyst says, well, what are you getting out of that? And then you say, well, I'm going to go to another doctor who's going to give me a pill so I stop hitting myself. That's fine. The psychoanalyst says, I don't give you a pill to make you stop. I just want you to understand, what are you getting out of hitting yourself? What satisfaction are you getting out of that? What are you hiding from? Or what are you punishing yourself for? What is the dream disguising? That question, what is the dream disguising, is this question about everything we do. What is it you're disguising by what you're doing right now? What do you really want? <laughs> That's the Freudian question. And there's no answer to that question, no one answer. In other words, you, you can't discover the truth of what you really want. You can discover many of the things you seem to really want from today's perspective. There is no objective certainty about who you really are and what you really desire. All there is is this inquiry into how the past has led you to have the desires you have. 
and led you to make the compromises with the, those desires that you are currently making. So that's all by way of, of background on Freud. Now, if you want to go back to that Library of Congress site, you can, you can look at the, the, on the, the section, I'll put the, the link up here again, uh, look at the section on dream interpretation. Uh, and, and dream interpretation, again, um, it's, it, the dream is a disguise, but there is a certain amount of repression in that disguise. That, that's why the dreams don't just say directly what you want. You can look at the section on repression as well. You'll see that fabulous, fabulous clip from The Simpsons uh, where um, Homer explains to Lisa uh, why uh, Marge should continue to repress her feelings so she'll never bother us any, again, right? You'll see that clip if you go over to the Library of Congress site. Repression is key for Freud because that is the mechanism that explains why you need interpretation, why you can't actually just, why we don't usually du directly express what we desire. We don't directly express our sexuality because there's this force that keeps us from ourselves, right? The self is divided in Freud. Unlike Rousseau, who thought you have to find, there's a true self hidden under all the disguises. In Freud, the true self is not just one thing, it's a contradictory uh, a set of forces. And our, our desires uh, are not uniform. Uh, even when we get a bit underneath the repressions and underneath the disguises, our desires are not uniform. They're a heterogeneous mix of conflicting impulses. A heterogeneous mix of conflicting impulses. And, and in a way, that can... That almost brings us to civilization as discontents. Um, uh, but I, I'd want to give you a little bit more on the Freudian notion of sexuality and desire, uh, which will help perhaps in, in understanding why you can't just find the original thing you really want, the really real, if I can put it that way, uh, of desire. Because for Freud, there isn't a really real of desire. And that's because... Freud theorizes that as infants, really, uh, as, as very small uh, children, uh, we begin to look for things to satisfy our elemental cravings, uh, but we look for things that are um, associated with those elemental cravings um, and, and um, never uh, actually look for the thing, um, that, the, the nourishment that we crave directly. That is, um, when, when, we, um, when we crave something, there's always an element of fantasy on top of instinct. There's always an element of fantasy on top of biology. So that you continue to search for your fantasies to satisfy your biology. <laughs> and um, when you find something that really does satisfy, it's because it's something you were searching for before. Not the, not the thing itself, but something that, some fantastic, some imaginary construct of what you originally biologically, instinctively craved. Um, uh, and, and, and for Freud, he has this expression, every, every finding of an object is a refinding of an object. Every finding of an object is a refinding of an object. And what he means is when we, when we discover something we really love, and we think, gosh, I finally found what I really love, it's actually some repetition of something we fantasized about before, um, something um, that we perhaps um, uh, uh, thought we lost before, uh, and um, continue to search for things um, that are, that are uh, rooted in our histories. I guess that's the, the point I really want to, to um, emphasize, is that it's, it's the rootedness in our histories um, uh, that, are, that are imaginary, uh, imaginary constructs on our biology um, that is behind Freud's notion of sex and desire. It's our hi understanding our history doesn't do away with these desires, uh, but understanding our history um, is the way we make meaning out of our desire um, and have some better chance of uh, being, as far as say, less miserable, uh, suffering less, uh, um, understanding our desires, um, uh, understanding why we search for the things we search for, um, um, gives us something closer to, to freedom, really, 
to um, the ability to love and to work. Getting a little far afield from civilization and its discontents, so perhaps I should, I should j jump back to that now. You remember the book starts off uh, with uh, um, uh, Freud's discussion of the oceanic feeling, the oceanic feeling. And uh, he, he's, he, he starts off that way uh, in, a, in a sense to give you a signal, and I hope you pick it up because of our early part of the course, it's a signal that he, Freud is an enlightenment thinker. The oceanic feeling is supposed to be um, a way of talking about religion that is less objectionable. He starts off with the critique of religion um, um, and the oceanic feeling. What's the oceanic feeling? Again, what's the oceanic feeling? Right at the beginning of the book. Yeah. Like eternity, like immensity. Yeah. Do you want to add to this? The feeling that we belong to the world. We, we feel like we belong to the whole world. We feel like we're all just part of the. We're part of the. What would you say? We're part of the. What, what would you, the force. What would you, the force. Well, sorry. Great the great scheme of things that works. Yeah, and and what is Freud? What is Freud's response to this? Because his friend is Romain Rolland, a famous writer, say, "Come on, Freud, you're so anti-religious. You're so you criticize all the magic and the incense and all that stuff. But come on, it's religion isn't about that. Religion is about this deep feeling of belonging to the world, to connect to everything. You're one with the universe." And Freud says, "Yo, oh, I see." What is his response? Well, he doesn't feel, but he goes a little further than that. I've never had such a feeling. So. It's, a little, it's very Voltairean. He says, yeah, it's what infants feel in the crib. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I remember the very beginning of the work. Oh, yeah, I know about this feeling. That's what babies have. And some people outgrow it. Remember Voltaire's response to Rousseau? Um, um, this is on the, just the second page uh, of the book. I cannot discover this oceanic feeling in myself. It is not easy to deal scientifically with feelings. <laughs> One, one can attempt to describe the physiological science. Um, he says, uh, this is a, a feeling of an indissoluble bond with the world as a whole um, uh, is something that you find in, in babies. And so for Freud, this is give it up. It's an infantile um, response to the world. So what Freud is doing here in the beginning of civilization and his discontents is he's, he's taking a classic enlightenment position that religion is, is bunk, um, a religion is infantile, and, um, and we have to face the world, as he so often says, with our sober senses. And that's Freud saying, I am part of the Enlightenment, I am part of this Voltairean tradition, um, and, uh, and uh, civilization is discontents is, is squarely in that uh, tradition. Uh, the, 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 the intellectual historian uh, and biographer of Freud, who's really insisted on this, Freud's Enlightenment uh, credentials, if I could put it that way, is Peter Gay, who, whose uh, uh, big biography of Freud has become uh, the st a standard source of narrative biography about Freud's life in, in general.